Hi, and welcome to episode number 40 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I am Francis Campoy, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Mandel. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm back. Yeah, welcome back. It was a, a short hiatus. I, I was very sad. I was sad to be gone, but I'm glad to be back. No, it was it was good. I got a different Australian, you know. I could even I could not even tell the difference really. So yeah, don't <laughs> worry, don't worry. You can you can leave again. It's fine. Okay, change is as good as a holiday, I guess. Yeah, we have many Australians to replace you, so it's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good to know that I'm loved and no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm very very happy you're back. Um, so today we're gonna have an interview with someone uh, that works for Rodeo FX. Yeah, really cool company that does some really cool stuff. It is a pretty amazing company. I've seen a couple of videos of their demos, and basically they do uh, they do uh, visual yes, effects, spe- visual effects, special effects for you know some people that you may have heard about, like uh, I don't know, Game of Thrones. Maybe you've heard about it. Deadpool. Yeah, you know, like it is pretty amazing. And yeah. uh, there's a couple of videos. We'll put the links on the on the show notes as usual. And this time I really recommend you to go check them out because they're they're pretty amazing they're to be awesome. honest. They're awesome. And after that we'll end up as usual with the question of the week. Uh, yeah. and the question of the week today is about it's something that you actually came up with. Yeah, well, I, I can't take credit. It was from the Slack community. Uh, we were talking about it on there, talking about uh, compute engine instances, uh, how to create an instance group from an already existing Google Compute Engine virtual machine. Cool. That is actually something I've done before. Yeah? Yeah, yeah cool. It is, it is fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it before because I helped someone do it, so yeah. it, was, it was a good time. Cool. So, yeah, we'll talk about that at the end of the episode. Uh, and now we are going to talk about the cool thing of the week. Yeah. And as actually it starts to be like as usual, it is not one cool thing of the week, but a bunch of them. There are too many cool things. Yeah, there's too many cool things. We need we need more episodes. Maybe we should do this episode da- episode daily. Don't don't no no <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I think it's I think we're fine. Uh, so yeah, we we have we have three products that are now generally available. Uh, so they're out of beta, and uh, you can now use them with SLAs and all that stuff. Uh, so we have Cloud SQL, Cloud Big Table, and Cloud Data Store. So three different ways of storing data, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, so just to be clear as well, so that's Cloud SQL, the second generation. Yeah. Which has way more power than the first one. Hugely, hugely cool. It is incredibly fast. Yeah, yeah, incredibly, incredibly fast. And Cloud Data Store, which, I mean, that's been around for a while, but is now generally available to everything outside of App Engine. Yeah, the I think it's the REST API that is, uh, because if you were using it from App Engine, it was already generally available for, from a long time ago. But now if you're using it from outside of it, uh, the the API itself is now generally available too. Which is cool. And Big Table is just, well, let's Big Table. It's always been really great. Big Table is amazing. Uh, it is it is really big. Yeah. Really big. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and on the other side, there's also a bunch of different things. And we're going to link to this. But there's one more thing that I wanted to mention because I was actually really impressed, which is uh, Google Cloud Storage Neonline. Uh, it is much faster than before. So quick overview, Google Cloud Storage Neoline, where you want to like archive long time data, probably yeah. not going to touch it very often. Like Mostly logs, backups, and yep. stuff like that, that you don't really care about them until you care about them. Yep. And then at that day, you will get like, you really oh care. yeah, I want the backup from like a year ago. You want it to be there, really. Yep. Uh, so yeah, like... I think the technical name is infrequently accessed data. Ooh. Yeah, and uh, normally uh, there's you know there's competitors that propose things like this, and it takes a couple hours to retrieve that data. Uh, from the beginning, Google proposed a solution. It was like a couple minutes mm-hmm. instead. Uh, then we went down to seconds. That's a bit better. And now it is as fast as normal cloud storage. That seems just right. Yeah, which is pretty amazing because <laughs> it's really fast. So it's uh, I could say it's probably around like couple hundred milliseconds. So, yeah. So, <laughs> as soon as you want that data is as soon as you're getting that data. Yeah, that data is there. So, that is pretty amazing. Uh, and I was so impressed that I decided to uh, talk about it today, but there's many other things. So, uh, go check it out. We have a link to an announcement with a bunch of new things that happened this week. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, why don't we go have a chat with Alan and hear all about visual effects in Google Cloud Platform? Sounds good. Let's go with that. We are joined today by a gentleman named Alan Frigman from Rodeo FX. Uh, how are you doing today, Alan? Hello. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do at Rodeo FX? So my name's Alan. Uh, I'm a pipeline developer at Rodeo FX. Uh, the company has been around for about 10 years. 
uh, and uh, I've been there for four, and it's it's grown a lot since I've been there. I initially started as what's known as a rigger, which is the the guy who uh, articulates the characters or vehicles or such. And then slowly in the last couple of years, I've been doing more of a developer role, doing more coding, mostly Python. And uh, uh, it's really exciting. Uh, the, the studio has grown from like 50 people to like 300 and something in, in, uh, in a couple of years. And it's crazy. So I can get a bit of an inkling from the name of the company, but what exactly does it do? Yeah, so we do uh, visual effects for film and high-end TV series. Uh, we've done some uh, work for the last three seasons of Game of Thrones and uh, the occasional commercial, but mostly film. Uh, we did some work on uh, the last Star Trek, some some work on Deadpool, Birdman, uh, the last Tarzan, uh, Fantastic Beasts, which is about to come out soon. Lots of creatures in that one, really exciting, and uh, some old stuff like uh, Pacific Rim and Edge of Tomorrow. Old stuff. Old stuff. <laughs> yeah. That is pretty awesome. Well, it seems old, uh, old uh, yeah. by my, <laughs> on my timeline. <laughs> no, th those are awesome. Uh, so when you describe yourself, you use the term pipeline developer? Yeah. What, what, is, what is that exactly? <laughs> so a, a, a pipeline in, in my industry, it's basically the, the sort of flow of, of data from one, one specialty to another, so to speak. So there's... A lot of specialties in visual effects. You can really not. It's really hard to be a one-man shop. You really gotta specialize, and any it goes through like modeling, uh, texturing, shading, animation, uh, rigging, animation, lighting, and layout, and uh, eventually compositing. Uh, and it, to to get everything to be versioned, and to flow, and to import and export, and and all the statuses of everything and everything to be out of up to date and correct and valid and follow convention. Uh, we, we, there's this term of the pipeline, which is basically sort of the, the, uh, conglomeration of tools. It's, it's kind of like if the tools were, uh, neurons in the brain, the, the mind would be the pipeline. It's sort of like the abstract all encompassing con concept. And a pipeline developer basically works towards making the, the flow of the information smooth. Cool. So could you tell us a little bit about what kind of tools uh, or what kind of products you use to, to make these happen? Uh, specifically uh, Google's or in general? No, in, in general. Like what kind of like Yeah, what, what is kind what of does tools? the process look yeah. like? Like somebody comes to you and they're like, Hey, we want this scene shot in a movie. Like where does how does that how does that look? So initially there's a bidding process where stu where studios uh, say how how much they will cost to do a particular shot, and it's up to the client to decide who to give what to based on their reputation and their their funding, I suppose. Um, once you we we get a shot and and it's confirmed, uh, the, we we usually receive the plates. Those have to be they have to go through what's known as uh, match moving, which is where some very uh, very careful people track the the, the motion of the camera with some specialized software that is not entirely automatic, unfortunately, and there's a lot of manual work to get that going. And once we have the camera, then we can start creating creatures and, and vehicles and whatever kind of replacement or enhancement that the shot requires. And those have to go through all the various stages initially with modeling. Well, obviously concept art, there's, there's no, if there's no concept, there's nothing to model, but initially modeling, the, then needs to be textured at some point. Uh, that can usually go in parallel, and uh, eventually that goes into the hands of riggers, which is what I, I used to be. And those guys, they are they articulate and add controls for the animators to use to bring it bring stuff to life, be it a, a creature or a a prop or an awesome robot or whatever. And and then at the same time, there's also occasional enhancements by, well, I, I, I say occasional, it's not really. Uh, there's a lot of enhancements of uh, simulations that happen, either water splashes, explosions, uh, rocks falling, all kinds of stuff that the effects department does in parallel while everyone else is trying to do the the creatures, vehicles, or props. And then eventually it all comes comes together with the help of the lighters, then the render farm, our hybrid render farm, the part cloud, part local. And... 
it goes into the hands of the compositors who then composite the final layers together and make the beautiful consistent look throughout the whole thing. And then that gets delivered to the client and they, they add music and uh, do the edit. Wow. So out of my experience, any, like I've done some rendering of videos Mm -hmm. and there's two problems with that. It takes forever and you end up with huge files. How do you make it happen? Like, I I mean I'm imagining that to make a like a, a dragon look real that's a lot of gigabytes and a lot of processing uh how do you how do you make these actually happen Yeah well we have a, a lot of storage uh, on on premise we uh I, we have a a mix of fi- different filers uh, that we have acquired through the years and uh it's all uh, presented through a caching appliance that we have uh, as, as one uh, common place for the mounts, and it's a, it's many hundreds of terabytes. It's it's really intense. And some of the stuff that we do in the pipeline to try to to minimize the du- the duplication is like to do th- sim links when stuff gets versioned but it doesn't really change. For example, when the textures get versioned again, and only like one one bit of the somewhere on the thing changed and we tried to sim link so that we don't have to copy so much data and try to keep it light. Uh, obviously not always the case, but we, we do where we can. And of course we use the, we use the cloud <laughs> to, to be able to, uh, render really massive, massive things. Okay. So you're saying, okay, you, you mentioned that you've got a lot of storage and, and CPU on prem. Uh, so where does, where does the cloud, where does Google cloud platform come in? Yeah. So, uh, we do a lot of, uh, different movies at the same time, a lot of different shows we call them. Um, it could be like a anything from like four to like a dozen shows uh, in different stages of production. And from time to time, there usually at the end of the week, there will be some kind of delivery to the client because you you deliver things as you start to complete them, or at least you deliver semi finished versions that look better and better. Uh, and it's very important that those deadlines must never, ever, ever be late. <laughs> those are set in stone and hmm. you must deliver. Uh, and so, uh, my, my wife's, uh, boss saw, saw the, saw the storm coming, so to speak. And he knew that about maybe a, a year and a half ago, two years ago, he, he, he saw it coming that we would get to the point where we just didn't have enough hardware to make everyone happy. And it would come that we would have a, a Friday where we could not actually deliver what we had to deliver and we would dis- disappoint the client and be in a bad position. And so he, he tasked me a long time ago, uh, to, to work on a sort of in implementation that would work together with our, with our current, uh, render farm software in such a way that is relatively seamless for the, the artist because it just shows up as another render node. It's not its own separate thing. Uh, it's not a whole other completely isolated brand new system per se. It's part of, it, it sort of comes as part of the same network as the current farm. So it, it almost gets treated as if it was a, a neighbor, so to speak. And then what you're, you're able to use that to expand your capabilities and like sort of use that elastic cloud to, to grow as you need it. Yeah, uh, uh, once we once we had it uh, had everything configured more or less right, uh, you can uh, very easily using uh, we were using the the managed instance groups feature, and we had a com- we have a few common templates for different specs, and usually we do a uh, different specs for different shows, depending on how how much they require, and we uh, we've been really. Uh, we use a lot the, the, dyna- the dynamic, the custom instance where you can drag, drag and drop the hmm. number of cores and number of amount of RAM. Oh, nice. Ever since that was, a, that was, uh, an option, we've been using it a lot and we always use custom instances because sometimes you don't really need all that much RAM, but we need more cores. And, uh, I'm excited to say that the, the, the cloud machines, the, the top of the cloud machines are considerably better than what we have on premise. <laughs> and nice. it's it's a it's an ongoing race. I mean, this, the second that we, it's very expensive to do a massive upgrade of whatever, two hundred nodes that we have locally, uh, and get them all to like the latest specs, and then uh, within a few months there's something new, and 
and having the cloud being able to to burst so easily in, in a matter of seconds, you can launch hundreds of machines, and uh, it's in the, it's so fast and so effortless that it's it's a great thing to have just when you really need to burst and you need you need the resources to to finish the computation of producing those images. We use a, a renderer co- called Arnold, which was recently acquired by Autodesk. And we do most of our work in our, out of this Maya and uh, fixing Houdini uh, and compositing in Nuke. Cool. So there's uh, as soon as you started talking about rendering, uh, preemptible machines came to mind. Is this something that you use or have you considered using it? Uh, yes, uh, we, we actually do use them. We don't use them exclusively because at the moment we... It's up to the discretion of the wrangler, which is the the person, the human being managing the the farm or overlooking the farm. Uh, it's up to their discretion how many machines should come up, depending on what our resources are. Like we only have so many, we have a fair number of licenses, but we only have so many. So sometimes we'll need a bit more on local, then a bit more on on cloud. It all depends. It fluctuates a lot, and it's it's a hard task to to do programmatically so for now we need mm. the human element of a uh, 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 wrangler to to make the call now that said we do have scripts once the machines come on and they they become idle they start to die uh, very quickly uh, one of the we one of the great things with the google cloud is the per minute billing i know there's a 10 minute minimum but af- after that is per minute and uh, we we have a script that after the second idle minute, the machine dies. So we really try not to waste any of the resources. But to start them, we at one point we had we we had given the artists the ability to start their own machines, and they got a little crazy. They, they would start a, a few too many, <laughs> and uh, we quickly realized that it had to be uh, overlooked by someone. Cool. So. You, I, I'm imagining that at any point you have a decent amount of a uh, decent number of machines running. How do you make yeah. sure that they all they all have the good configuration? Uh, how do you manage uh, the software install licenses and all that stuff? Um, so just before that, I just remember one thing about the preemptibles. We do use them. Uh, the reason that the thing is that we don't use them exclusively because the the well the way that they work is they will die eventually uh, at, at without notice. Uh, but we, while the, while the Wrangler is physically present in the, at work, we will try to use them as much as we can. And then when they leave for the night, we will do a switch and we'll start some regular VMs. And that way we're, we know that there's going to be some VMs left just to be is totally, that, totally is that sure. So if they, if they happen to shut down while the person's looking, they can manually restart them. Yeah. Yeah. Or the, yeah, basically that, cause they're more likely to survive. But as during the day, we use them as much as we can when we use the cloud. And so go, to go to the next question uh, uh, that you just asked, um, we coordinate all the configuration with SaltStack. I don't know if you're familiar with the technology. Can you can you explain explain for our listeners so for people who aren't, aren't as familiar with it? Yeah, it's a it's a configuration and deployment tool. It's uh, the core is written in Python, and I like Python, so I like it. It's quite configurable mm. in uh, really, really flexible, and it has. It's very straightforward. I mean, there's other things like Anc- Ansible or or Chef. Uh, they're similar. I haven't tried many of the others, but I really like Salt. It's very easy to configure. It's all based on YAML files, which are very human readable. Uh, you can have uh, conditional templating and um, multi multiple masters if you want. Uh, it's it's quite flexible. And so we, so we have, we actually use, for example, we query some of the VM metadata on the machine to, conf- to configure itself. So we set some tags and some, uh, some env- basic, well, not environment variables, some metadata variables. And we use those to, for, for example, configure which show the, the slave will be for. And that's, that's using salt to read the metadata to then configure the machine on, on first boot. 
So like you were talking about you, the person who's working on the show, they can fire up machines and they can then specify like, hey, I need these resources and then Salt will go off and configure those resources for them. Is that, does that sound about right? Yeah, but basically we use the managed instance groups with the custom templates that we keep, we keep cloning a, a sort of a default template. We change a few attributes for this, the specs and what show, what we have a code name for each show, what code name it will be for. And then those machines will launch uh, given whatever number you request of them, they will appear and they will begin uh, taking jobs uh, from those shows. Cool. Um, so you've been talking about how you have like an on-prem and a cloud like sort of shared solution. Yeah. How are you like? I'm guessing there's some assets that will need to go like up and down. Like, how is that managed? What sort of challenges have you got there? Yeah. So we we initially we tried stuff like R sync and and maybe even uh, SCP, which is not not fast. <laughs> it's it's very single threaded. It's it works, but it's really not not fast. And then we, I started looking at options, and there's a few uh, that are sort of flood via UDP to maximize the the throughput. But the the one that really took the cake for me was a, a piece of soft, a piece of technology from the guys at CERN, the the super collider people. They have a a software called FDT, it's just uh, very originally called Fast Data Transfer, hmm. and it's a, it's it's made in Java. They don't provide the source; it's not technically open source, but it is free. It is free to use, and it's uh, incredibly fast. Uh, you you can use it over a, a VPN, SSH tunnel, or or directly if you want, and. Uh, basically, it, it, it's a bit like Aspera, if you if you know what that is. A, a lot of people use it in my industry, but but Aspera is very expensive. Uh, FTT is the same idea. It's, it's a flood of UDP packets that maximize your pipe, and it's extremely concurrent. There's a you can start hundreds of threads uh, with a bunch of data, and it all arrives at the same time, and it. It's 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 so far the only tool that we've seen that can really like absolutely maximize our, our gigabit pipe that we have going to the internet. Are you are you able to share how fast you're able to get some data transfers or, or things you may have seen? Uh, uh, well, we only have a gigabit internet uh, at our studio at the moment, and we pretty much fill it up. If we get like eight to nine hundred megabit. It's like, and and we had a few times when we were when I was. Uh, getting started with this technology that I that uh, I accidentally choked the network, <laughs> mm-hmm. and for a few seconds we lost internet because it was too fast, which I guess is a good problem to have. Better than too slow. Cool. Um, so uh, now I'm also curious. Um, I guess you probably work on some relatively big budget and somewhat secret type projects. Yeah. What do you have in terms of like security? What sort of considerations have you had that way to to make sure everything is not public to the internet, probably in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, we tried to. Well, we use the the Google the Google Cloud platform uh, firewall to pretty much block all access except to the the IP from Montreal. That's one thing, and we tried to use VPN wherever possible, and we believe that's reasonably secure. So how? How are you using VPN? Is that so the machines that are on the cloud are able to access the on-prem storage, or do you use it for some other things? Uh, we use it to for for licensing, uh, for licensing and and to actually talk to the the farm software. We use a a, a software called Cube with a Q. It's for a, from a company called Pipeline FX. Um, it's it's quite flexible. We have used it for many years now, and we have customized it a lot. And it's it's not rocket science. It's basically a queue manager, um, and people make make jobs. They they give it they give them attributes. They give them what what cluster they should go for, how much RAM they should have, and so on. And and the machines appear just the same as the machines on on the local machines appear. The cloud ones are just in the same place, in the same interface, the same everything. So it's it's quite seamless. The only thing is that we we require having a an upload of the the things that are required by your scene file, which is like one extra job, and we require one extra download job so that the files as they complete they get downloaded back, and we use FTT for that, and it's very very fast. 
what is the process for someone to be like, oh, we have this scene that we need to process right now very fast. Like, do you have a turbo button or something? Oh, to, I to see. To start like a bunch of instances or something like that. Uh, we do not have a turbo button, but we we do basically, when you submit a job to the cloud, you, it's the same as submitting a job locally. There's just a checkbox that says, use the cloud. Okay. And it just configures the job differently. It scans for the dependencies of the the thing that you're rendering tries to find all the terabytes worth of textures and models and cameras and animations and puts it in a big upload job through FTT and then it submits to the farm just as it would be without the cloud. Cool. Uh, so we're kind of running out of time, uh, yep. but is there anything else that you would like to mention or uh, something that we had forgotten? So uh, an interesting thing I, I guess I'd like to mention is that we're using GlusterFS for our storage solution on the cloud. It's an open source project that allows very, very easy distributed uh, redundant storage across multiple machines. In this case, we use VMs. And it's a way to get m faster reads than, an, than just one machine, one disk. And it allows us to scale really easily. It's very easy to, to add more they call it bricks, more sort of units of storage, sort of kind of like adding more disks. And uh, it makes it very, very easy and very fast. And it's it's open source. It takes like 10 minutes to get started to do a, your own, your first shared volume. It's really quite wonderful. And I, cool. had, I had tried when the very first time that I started on the cloud, I tried to see how fast could I get just one machine with like an NFS share that would be just shared a few after to a few machines and after a few after something like 40 machines it was just too much it just couldn't take it and that wasn't google's fault it was just nfs is really not the way to go one one node cannot store all your storage that's that's not going to not going to scale but now we have a at the moment we have like six storage nodes and they're all sharing several terabytes worth and it's it's very fast it's comparable to what we have locally out of curiosity, you didn't use Google Cloud Storage because ClusterFS gives you some other capability or something, or what's the deal there? Well, we, well, we don't, we didn't use the. There's an open source project to mount the Google Cloud Storage, but I, but it's not a, it's not a super stable or super tested, so mm -hmm. we, I did not trust trust it for for serious production, and Cluster just allows us to have a safe, redundant, shared volume that. Something like NFS would not be able to to give us, and and we we can't directly without mounting without having something to mount a Google Cloud storage, we can't directly use it. So we mm. we use it as sort of a trans transitionary place or as a place mm. for backups and stuff like that. That's fair. Cool. Well, um, Alan, thank you so much for joining us. That was really interesting. It's a thank you. The world of VFX is something that I know nothing about, and so it's it's a it's a very interesting view to see behind the curtain a little bit. Great. Yeah, very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thanks again to Alan for such an interesting interview. Uh, I know the next time I will go to the movies, I will be checking out, is this, is this actually rendered? Is this real? Uh, it is pretty amazing what they're able to do nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a few movies that they've worked on that now I want to go see. So that's pretty cool as well. Awesome. So why don't we get stuck into the question of the week, uh, which comes from the wonderful community members from the Google Cloud Platform Slack channel. Um, we were talking about on there the other day about, say you have a Google Compute Engine virtual machine instance, you have it up and running, and you think to yourself, oh, I'd love to be able to scale this. Uh, so what I want to be able to do is create an instance groups, which lets me scale that up and down really easily. Is there a way that I can create a instance group from an already running VM? So uh, I actually had to do this a long time ago for a demo, uh, which is actually open source, and we've talked about it before. It's called Abelana. And basically, when I was in the development phase of it, uh, I created an instance, and then I installed ImageMagick on it. Yep. And installing ImageMagick was actually a couple. Like, it took me some time. Then I realized that you could do sudo apt-get, yeah. whatever. <laughs> but it took me some time to get the whole environment set, uh, working, out, uh, working correctly. And the next step is like, oh, OK. So now I want to have this instance, but just running more of them. Yep. Uh, 
And, and it's actually quite simple. Uh, if you are in development phase and you can delete that instance, it is pretty simple. You can delete the instance by making, um, making sure that you do not delete the disk attached mm-hmm. to it. And then you can create a new image from that disk. And now when you create your instance template in the, insta- in the manage instance group, you can use that new image that you just created. So with that, you're good. Yeah, that's, that's not too many bad. Too yeah, many steps. that is pretty simple. So from uh, from your instance with the disk, you yep. delete the instance because you need to uh, to create a new image. You need a disk that is not attached to anything. Yep. So you first delete the, the instance without deleting the disk, then create an image, and then from there, the template. So if we have a VM that's running and you still want to be able to work on it though and you don't want to delete it, what do we do then? So that is where <laughs> that is when it becomes a little bit more complicated because basically what you need to do is an extra step to generate a disk that is not attached to anything. And to do that, there's a little trick that I did not know about, but you told me, uh, which is create a snapshot from the disk yep. and then a disk from the snapshot. Yep. And then the rest is the same. The rest is the same. So you yeah. can create your image, you can create your instance template, um, and you're way to go. Yeah, which is... It is actually pretty simple, uh, and that way you, you're able to go basically from your prototype to something that actually scales, and you can do whatever you want from it. Yeah, yeah, which is uh, which is the normal uh, the normal development process that I use. The next step is normally oh, the, so now that everything is already in instances, maybe I will use containers and move to container engine and stuff like that. Yeah, but maybe you work on VMs. That's where you're at. And that's totally cool. And that is totally fun. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Awesome. So. Thank you very much for another episode, Francesc. Are you going to be anywhere exciting in the coming weeks? So not really. I'm actually going to stay in San Francisco working on my videos and working on a couple of things that I want Ooh. to do. Do yeah. we have some more episodes of Just for Funk coming up? There. So I published one and there's a couple more that I'm editing right now. And if you have any ideas about things that you would like to, to have uh, on that series, send them my way. I'm always curious about it. Excellent. What about you? Uh, so I'm going to be mm, kind of attending a couple of conferences coming up, actually. It was just a bit weird for me. That's kind of fun. That's, that feels good, though, when you it, go to a conference and you have the pressure of speaking. It, yeah. So, so I'll be at PAX Dev. Um, I'll be just attending that. So hanging out with a bunch of gamers, which is uh, something I love to do. Uh, and then I'll be off to one of my favorite conferences, uh, which is Strange Loop in St. Louis uh, in September. Uh, looking at, there's some on-session stuff. I may end up doing a little bit of something there. We'll see We'll see how that goes, but I'll definitely be there. Uh, that's not an event I would miss out on. Very cool. Uh, so we have not done it in a while. So maybe we should remember our listeners how Ooh. to get in touch with us. Yes. So uh, there's a bunch of ways to do it. We have a web page. Yeah. It's gcppodcast.com. Or... Uh, cloud.google.com slash podcast. Good. Uh, also, we have an email. Uh, hello at GCP Podcast. We are on Twitter. At GCP Podcast. On Google Plus. At plus GCP Podcast. On Reddit. At slash r slash GCP Podcast. And finally, we are also, we have the channel podcast yeah. on the Google Club Platform Community it's Slack, Slack channel. channel. Yeah, there you go. absolutely. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it is a little. All right. Well, yes. Thank you so much again for joining me. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, thank you to all our listeners for being there. Yeah. And uh, see you all next week. Yeah. Talk to you all next week. Thanks.